Welcome to this video about the interesting applications of different types of waves. Let's look first at sound and ultrasound waves. They are both longitudinal waves, which if you remember means that the oscillations that cause them um, travel parallel to the direction of the wave, so in this case both left to right. Now in a longitudinal wave, in a sound wave, there are parts where the air particles are bunched up, which are called compressions, and there are parts where they are spread out, which is called a rare faction. Not to be confused with refraction, um, they're annoyingly very similar but a rare faction where the particles are spread out. If you wanted to label one wavelength for this wave you just go for the middle of one compression to the middle of another compression as I've written in green here. So this sound wave um, travels through the air, um, it allows us to hear uh, the air particles, the vibrations in the air particles reach your eardrum um, and allow you to hear. Now human hearing only occurs between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. Anything outside of that humans cannot hear. Um, it is called ultrasound waves, kind of meaning you know, extra sound waves. Now humans can't hear those types of waves, um, however um, bats and dogs um, and certain other animals um, can. So it's not like they're not there, it's just our ears have not evolved to be able to hear them. But we can use ultrasound waves for lots of different uses other than hearing. Uh, one of them, uh, the main ones you've probably heard of, uh, which is to scan fetuses or fetal scanning. Um, not checking for babies. Um, please make sure you are careful how you phrase it. Um, as well as that, you can also check for cracks in buildings, in building materials. Um, and you can actually use their destructive properties um, to have high amplitude ultrasound waves can destroy kidney stones inside your body. Now these are very safe um, uh, treatments um, for scanning fetuses, it's considered extremely safe, definitely safer than an x-ray um, because it's non-ionizing, uh, whereas x-rays are. So how do they work? Now to explain how they work, um, I like to use an example of sonar, which is how we use sound waves um, aboard ships to figure out where the seabed is, um, but also uh, how to catch fish. So what happens is um, the ship would emit a uh, sonar uh, or a sound wave, um, and it will take a certain amount of time to bounce back from the sea floor. If it takes less time, it shows the ship that there is something in the way. It could be fish, could be submarine, could be a, a wreck or something like that. To calculate the distance to those fish so it can put its nets out, um, it knows the speed of the wave that it emitted. All it needs to do is to measure the time. Now, as well as that, it needs to be half the time because it's going there and back. The distance we are looking at is only the distance there, so you have to half the time it takes to go there and back. Now, this is the same principles behind uh, fetal scanning. Um, look at my very, very terrible diagram here. This is a fetus in the womb. Um, it's surrounded by fluid and you've got muscles and fats and tissues and things like that there. Um, the wave that goes into uh, the person's body will reflect back when there is a change in media or change in material or substance it's traveling through. For example, when it goes from the skin to the fetus or you know from the um, bone to the fetus as well, it will reflect back and we can measure the time taken. Now, for especially cracks in buildings, you might see sometimes little graphs like this, which show the time taken um, for the wave to bounce back. So all you would do is measure the distance between when it was emitted and when it was reflected back and allows you to find out really, really precisely um, where that crack might be. So how would you write this in an exam question and answer? Uh, well, it'd be the same for all three, all those uses really, uh, for sonar, for fetal scanning, uh, checking cracks in buildings. Uh, the wave will reflect or bounce off when there is a boundary between two different media. Now, media is the plural for medium. Um, it's just a fancy physics word meaning a substance. So you can usually say substance here, that's fine, but you'll find textbooks will say media. So for example, when it changes from water to fish in the sonar example, or when it changes from skin to bone inside um, the abdomen trying to find a fetus. When you do that, uh, all you need to do is measure the time taken to bounce back. Um, then you find the depth or the distance using our equation speed equals distance times, uh, sorry, distance equals speed times time. That's pretty much it for ultrasound. Now let's look at seismic waves. Um, so seismic waves are essentially earthquakes um, and earthquakes um, happen obviously when there is tectonic movement, which you might know if you do geography. Um, we can detect them using seismographs um, or seismometers that allow us to see seismographs, um, which you'd find have little waves in them, which look a bit like this and then like this, uh, depending on the size of the earthquake. Now you'll notice there are two types of waves that occur that cause these kind of oscillations here. They're called 
primary waves, uh, also called P waves, um, and they're called secondary waves, um, which are also called S waves. Obviously, the primary waves come first, the secondary waves come second, um, and it's worth noting at this point, the primary waves are longitudinal, and the secondary waves are transverse. Please see my other vi uh, video if you want to look at the difference between those two terms. The way to remember it is uh, transverse has an S in it, just like secondary waves begins with an S, um, so you remember which way around they are. And what that allows us to do is allow scientists to essentially analyze and see the internal structure of the Earth. So not just to see you know, what shape the Earth is, but to see what kind of materials are inside the Earth. Is it solid, is it liquid, etc. Because obviously we can't dig down because it's very hot. So how would this work then? Um, here's planet Earth. Let's say I've got my earthquake happens to be um, on this side of the planet Earth and the waves are gonna get transmitted to the other side of the Earth where you'd have lots of seismographs set up. So as the waves travel through, you've got some P waves, which I'm gonna draw in black, uh, traveling through. Um, and they are going from one side of the Earth uh, to another. Now these waves will be slightly curved because they are changing uh, densities. Well, we can we can tell the densities inside the Earth by looking at these waves. Um, so essentially, they are refracting. Um, if you want to look at that word, look at my video on refraction uh, due to uh, different densities. So some of the um, kind of molten iron and material inside the Earth's core is different densities to others. So that's our P waves. Now, as well as that, you will also have S waves which travel through the Earth. However, they will not reach all the way through the Earth for a very important reason. So the S waves will reach here and they'll reach here, but they will not travel through the area near the center. And the reason for that, um, and we so we don't detect any S waves there at all, um, it's called a shadow zone. Um, kind of like a light has a shadow where there's no light. And the reason there is no S waves detected there is because S waves are transverse and cannot travel through liquid. So what it tells us then, if we don't detect any S waves, is that the core or the, the kind of outer core um, of the Earth, um, there is a fair amount of liquid there because we don't detect any S waves. So that just finishing off there, says it doesn't travel through liquid at all.